the well-known Russian writer Maxim Gorky recounts an experience he had. He was visiting some peasants in Russia. You will remember this was the period of the, the heady days of the communist revolution in the earlier part of the 20th century. And he was extolling to the patient, to the peasants, the virtues of science and technology. And was telling them about the miracles that technology had produced. And at the end of his whole discourse, one peasant stood up and said, well, yes, humans can fly in the air like the birds. They can move on the seas and the oceans like the fish. But can we live on land as humans? That was his question. And it struck Maxim Gorky very deeply. Mr. Narayan Bhagul, Mr. Lakshmi Narayana, Mr. Peter Gartenberg, Mrs. Lalita Kumar Mangalam, Mr. Sumit Ganguly, and ladies and gentlemen. I feel very honored and happy to be here in your midst to share some thoughts on science and technology and its role for humanity and whether it is an enabler and I will use the word disabler. <laughs> I was hearing with interest the views of the panelists here, a very interesting discussion. And I must make a confession that it was not without some flutters of the heart. Sumit mentioned that very few contrarian points were offered in that panel discussion. I assure you, I will make up for that lack. <laughs> and I do not think I will win a popularity contest uh, considering what I have to say. At the very outset, however, I must clarify that it is only with the intention of presenting a very balanced point of view to ensure that technology is harnessed for the good in the optimal way that I will point out uh, the things that I will place before you this evening. I do very much appreciate and understand the benefits that technology is providing and will provide in the future. But the anecdote of Maxim Gorky that I recounted before you, perhaps will set the tone for what I have to say this evening. As far as the benefits of technology, past, present and future, I think a lot is being said and has been said. I am an engineer by training and background, but I am not in touch for the last 35 years. So I am certainly not an expert on technology. <coughs> but it is very easy for us to see those areas in which technology has made rapid strides in various aspects of human endeavor and human life. Communication, transport, efficiency at the workplace, and above all, uh, medical field. So many benefits have taken place in the diagnostics, in the medicines available, in uh, modes of analysis and so on. So certainly I do not deny uh, that these benefits <coughs> exist and that we can tap into them. However, it is with some trepidation and some concern that I see that there is some kind of, uh, maybe it's a very strong word to say, euphoria about the role that technology can play, as if it were to be like a panacea for all the ills that plague humanity. And that is something that causes concern to me. Very, I hope that we are,
careful to not exaggerate the effect or the benefits that technology will have for us. Technology is very charming. And it is very tantalizingly presenting before humanity these various charms, these tantalizing charms. And the human society has become excessively mesmerized by the charms of this technology. And it is understandable that people are so mesmerized because what we see in terms of what technology has presented to us is almost miraculous. If we talk about the technological advancements that we have today, and if a person, let's say, even two centuries ago, were to be told about this, he would dismiss it as being impossible. And he would say, this is just miraculous, it cannot happen. But these things are a reality today. So the progress has been so rapid, and it has been so all-encompassing, that it has practically <coughs> permeated <coughs> into our consciousness very, very deeply. Today we have, and it's not only today, it started from the time of the Industrial Revolution. And the, it's like a typhoon that has grown in intensity. You know storms and cyclones as they move, sometimes they grow in intensity up to a point, and then they begin to ebb after some time. <coughs> so this typhoon of technology is moving through and sweeping away the consciousness of human beings <coughs> who have come to think of technology as the cure for everything. <coughs> Some years ago you had a very bad experience here in Chennai with uh, the cyclones. And unfortunately Chennai has been prone to uh, the vagaries of nature quite significantly. But at least this cyclone came, it conquered, but it left, it passed. But this typhoon of technology, thank you very much. This typhoon of technology is not about to pass. It's here to stay, as some of our panelists pointed out. And it's only going to grow. It's not going to ebb. And therefore, as we grapple with this typhoon, which is bringing some benefits, undoubtedly, we will also have to worry about what the ill effects are, what the bad consequences are going to be. And therefore, I believe it is important to offer some words of caution so that we, we may view this whole subject with a sense of balance. <clears throat> if we were to ask the common person, an educated person as well, as to whether he or she thinks that human society has made advancement in the last few decades, or the last century or two, most likely the person will reply, yes, we have indeed made a lot of progress. We have become more civilized. There has been more development. <clears throat> and if you further ask that person as to why he or she thinks so, it is also likely that that person will cite examples of technological advancements to back the view. We have spaceships, we have computers, we can do wonderful things with technology. <coughs> so, interesting, because we see now that in the minds of most people, there are two things that are conflated or equated. On one hand, we have technological advancement. <clears throat> and on the other hand, we have notions like progress, development, or even words like civilization. <clears throat> what is a cause of concern, and I believe something that we should think about very deeply is whether the two are equivalent whether it is justified for us to conflate the two. Is it technological advancement that makes a society civilized? Is technological advancement the yardstick by which we measure <coughs> progress or development? These are more questions that I think we need to consider 
we need to revisit our ideas of what progress means, what development means, what civilization means. After all, technology is not something that is unique to humans. It is not the exclusive preserve of humanity. The entire animal kingdom exhibits, in many cases, astonishing degrees of technology. The insects, the birds, the animals do so. <clears throat> Those of you who are students of zoology will have more knowledge of this. I'll just give a few instances of this. The ants, the way they go about making their hill, the ant hill. The desert ants who live in the Sahara Desert at 70 degrees centigrade temperature make a cool home for themselves below the sand. They come up forage for food, which is mostly dead insects, and they find their way unerringly back into their cool abode. If you look at fish, like the salmon, certain species of salmon fish, <clears throat> they travel thousands of miles from the headwaters of the river into the ocean and they disperse. Thousands of them come together, but they disperse and for six years they live in the deep ocean. After six years exactly, they all assemble at that very same delta from where they dispersed. And they all go together, swimming against the current to the headwaters, hundreds of miles away. And they go there unerringly, uh, taking the note without avoiding any wrong turns in the process. What kind of navigational skills and technologies do they use? What kind of navigational technologies do the birds use when they migrate thousands of miles what kind of technology do they have by which they are able to eat excessively to build up just the right amount of weight so that they have enough fat to burn, just enough to get to the destination, not a little more, not a little less. And they know the directions. Did you know, for example, that in their navigational efforts, the birds use three types of compasses. One is the sun, the second are the stars at night, and the third is the magnetic field of the earth. Apart from that, the birds are also able to uh, recognize terrain like oceans and mountains and plains and so on. They also recognize the gravitational forces and atmospheric pressure and the variations in all of these things. So today we have a great degree of trouble in navigating. Our aircraft need complex navigational systems which has taken so much technology to build and still sometimes we make mistakes. The animals like the weaver bird or the birds, they make astonishing nests with weaving of grass and twigs and they make loops and knots which we as humans will, will need a lot of application of mind and practice to do it. So they have their technologies as well. Their architecture, their civil engineering, their transportation, their means of protection, uh, defending themselves. They have technologies. And if we argue that, well, our technologies are so much more advanced than that of the animals and the birds and the insects, I can only point out in return the anecdote of Maxim Gorky, which I started this lecture with. Yes, we are advanced in all respects in terms of technology. We do things in a more sophisticated way. The animals are very gross in the way they do things. And we are more polished and more sophisticated. But does that necessarily make us civilized? So coming now to the question of what actually constitutes civilization. Is it that civilization is about economic development even? Is it that civilization is about how well we dress? How nicely we make our houses? I beg to uh, submit at this August gathering that that is not how we should be thinking of civilization. Civilization means 
to exhibit human qualities and make the human being rise in his or her level of humanity to that divine platform, to some platform that is sublime and spiritual, where the individual and the collective body of individuals will exhibit such very divine qualities, like for example love, kindness, mercy, forgiveness, sharing, brotherhood and sisterhood, compassion, tolerance, Development of such qualities <coughs> is the hallmark of civilized behavior. In the absence of development of such qualities, regardless of what kind of technological and economic development we have, are we really civilized? That is the question. Actually, when we look at the world around us, read the newspapers, hear the news on the television, and just basically be observant people. What kind of messages are we seeing about the state of our civilization? Let me consider a few things. Let me offer some contrarian points. We're aware of these things, but it's perhaps helpful to be reminded of some of these things. Let's consider the phenomenon of suicides. <clears throat> Happy people don't commit suicides. Do we know the statistics of suicides? I did a little, I did a little internet research before coming. Use some technology. <coughs> 800,000 people in the world commit suicide every year. 135,000 people in India commit suicide every year. In Japan, it is only in 2016 that the figure went to 22,500. Otherwise, in 13 years prior to that, every year, the number of suicides were more than 30,000. Even in the industrialized nations, the nations that the world prefers to call civilized and, and developed, we still use terminologies like developed world, the first world, the third world, so ingrained in our language and terminology is a mindset that reveals what our understanding of the word civilization is. Where we equate civilization with economic development, technological development and external sophistication. But here you have these advanced countries. We have these technologically developed countries, economically developed countries the suicide rates are also alarmingly high. And also a cause of concern is a very large, perhaps a disproportionately large, number of these people who commit suicides are young people. And the reasons they commit suicide is often related to uh, personal factors like loneliness, alienation, depression, dysfunctional relationships, stress, inability to cope with the competitive world around them, inability to handle technology even, as we have seen in India in recent months, unfortunately. So this is something that we need to reflect on very deeply. The number of suicides does not, does not reflect the tragedy actually because there are many, many more people who attempt suicide but are unsuccessful. And there are many more who would probably would want to commit suicide or try to, but they don't have the courage to do so. So what we are talking about are staggering numbers of people who are unhappy in this world. Let's talk further about divorce rates. Even in India, I the figures are rising in such an alarming way. I know some people who are lawyers and some of them are also matrimonial lawyers and the kind of stories that we can hear from them uh, I think is enough to make you lose your sleep every night. What is happening in this world that makes people fight like this? They fall in love and then they bitterly quarrel and then the quarrels become so bitter, uh, they separate and there is so much of trauma involved. 
In America, I'm told 50%, and also in other places, 50% of the marriages, they break up within the first three years of marriage. The divorce rates, 50%, 60%, 70%, and rising only. What to speak of other relationships where uh, they just tolerate each other somehow and go on. I read another interesting statistic when I was in England last year, or this year earlier. It says, uh, I think this is in a, a journal called the Cyber Psychology Journal or something like that. It was a, a research paper published there. It says that Facebook is a leading cause of divorces in the UK. And this article said that one third of the divorces are caused because of Facebook. Either because one of the other spouse is too engaged in Facebook to be able to talk to the other partner, or because the person is conducting some illicit relationships across the Facebook. And they, they meet somebody on, online and then they, they have some other affairs and so on. So these are things that are sobering, things we need to reflect, things that we need to consider. And let's talk about internet. Well, what can we say about internet? Let me introduce you, in case you're not familiar, with some new terminologies. The Center for Internet Addiction Recovery. Yes, it's a, it's a serious center with professionals involved. I think it's in America, perhaps. And the psychologists today have evolved new terminologies for new mental ailments that have emerged in this internet era. There is IGD. Does anyone know what it means? Internet Gaming Disorder. Those of you who are parents are probably familiar with this. You see it with your children. And you're probably struggling with it like every other parent is doing. We have CIU, Compulsive Internet Use. This is jargon of psychiatrists and psychologists. IAD, Internet Addiction Disorder. Today, we, and I mix a lot with young people and also with parents of young people. And there is hardly ever any parent who does not share a concern and in some cases alarm, and in some cases more than that, about the plight of their children who have become addicts. Day and night, literally even night, they spend in front of the computer or with their mobile phones, playing games, and the kind of ill effects that this has on their mental faculties, on their intelligence, on their creativity, on their emotional development, on their physical health, and so on, is a subject of much research. Much to be said, but time does not permit me to say this today. I'm sure we're all aware, we're witnessing this all around. So it is important for us, if we have to evolve a strategy for harnessing the benefits of technology, we must take into account all these alarming trends that are happening. What are we doing with the coming generations? What kind of human beings are we going to have populate the world after we leave this world? It can sometimes be a scary thought when you look at this. So these are again some things that we need to be concerned about. Let's also talk about another aspect where technology has proved immensely harmful, but it also has its other side, and that is transportation. In order to solve the transportation problem, we had cars, and we have aeroplanes, and so on. It is, however, an unfortunate fact, a reality of life, that solutions to problems in this world, if those solutions are material, invariably give rise to many other material problems. So we have a problem, we have a material solution for that problem, but we find that in trying to solve that problem, we may be successful or unsuccessful, un unsuccessful in doing that, but that gives rise to many other problems. 
Let's consider the motor car as an example of this. One could take any phenomenon, any of our technological gadgets uh, and, and apply the same logic to it. Yes, cars have indeed helped us in transportation. Let's however consider what problems the cars have caused. Number one, pollution. Enormous pollution. We all know about the problems Delhi is facing now. We've been reading all about it in the newspapers. We know the problems every country in the world is facing. Beijing, what kind of problems they are facing with pollution. And it's not only the uh, pollution caused by the cars. These cars are produced in factories which themselves generate a lot of pollution. The equipment, the appliances, the spare parts, the ancillaries that these industries use are also produced by other industries which they in turn produce their own pollution and you go backwards. And ultimately you need raw materials for which you have to do to mine the earth. I come from a place, I not come from, I reside many months in a place called Berigam, which is not far from Goa. And there has been a huge controversy in Goa in the last few years because hundreds and thousands of tons of, of mineral of, for iron ore has been exported to China which is energy hungry and industry hungry. And there's been a huge uprising. The Supreme Court, I believe, stepped in and then put a stay on it or something like that. Literally, a significant percentage of the land mass of Goa is lost, is gone to China. And what to speak of the pollution that it brings when the, the, the iron ore, the mineral is being transported, it flies everywhere the respiratory diseases that come as a result of this. And all this is possible because of modern technology. It's coming because of a misuse of modern technology, yes, but technology nevertheless. The shipping, the transportation on the road is enabling this to happen. In the previous days, there was mining, there was technology, but things were simpler. It was not possible to cause damage on a large scale. What technology has done is, in as much as it has enabled humanity to do good on a scale that is unprecedented, it has also afforded opportunities to do harm on an unprecedented scale. It is very important, therefore, that we do some real cost-benefit analysis here. When it comes to traveling by car, I share a, hu a humorous uh, anecdote with you that I had with somebody I was driving with, or he was driving me rather, and he was driving rather fast. And I cautioned him and I said, you know, I think you better slow down. I think we're going too fast. So he replied rather, rather flippantly, he said, you know, God is with us. So I said, no, no. God gets off at 70 kilometers per hour <laughs> from the car. So now we are on our own, remember, there's no God here now. There was the ambassador of a particular country, a communist country, who finished his tenure in India and was, a, and was about to depart. And in the passing, he happened to mention to somebody that after his tenure in India, he had started believing in God. So somebody asked him, perhaps it's because you were exposed to the spiritual wisdom of India. He said, no, after looking at the traffic here and considering that I've survived, there can be only one answer that God exists. And I can heartily uh, share his, his uh, uh, you know, feelings. Uh, so this is, this is where we are in terms of uh, transportation, etc. And take any aspect of modern technology. And here we have all these things that we need to think about. Being a man of religion, sometimes people accost me. I should use the word accost, even at airports or something. They come and ask challenging questions. Um, sometimes it's young people. 
And I had this young lady coming up to me at an airport, and uh, she said, you, you're from religion? I said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, you know, yes. I said, yes. She said, but religion has caused so much harm. It has caused so much damage to the world. So much killing has taken place because of, of, uh, uh, of religion. So I said, yes, indeed. It is undeniable that uh, so much harm has been caused in the name of religion. If you look at human history, wars have been fought in the name of religion. Hatred, bigotry, and so on has prevailed in the name of religion. Undoubtedly, you're right. But then I asked her, is that the only reason for mass killings, for violence, for cruelty, and for all the ills that plague humanity today? Are there other factors that are responsible, perhaps to a much greater degree than religion? What about politics? What about the depredations of Stalin and Mao and Pol Pot and Hitler and so many other despots who have ruled? What about all the disasters caused by military weaponry and all the wars that have been fought? Do you know, for example, that the number of deaths that have been caused due to war and weapon-related incidents in the 20th century is more than the deaths caused by war and, or in violent means like this in the previous 19 centuries. And the, the reason is that humanity has acquired technology with which misguided people have been able to inflict damage guided missiles and misguided men. I think it was Martin Luther King who said that. So in order to guide our missiles, we have misguided people who use that technology for a wrong purpose. Therefore we see that technology is also responsible. So are you going to say ban technology? Just as you're saying because religion has, is a cause of much problem, so also is technology. So if you say we should ban religion, should you also ban technology? The answer is of course no. And that is because the problem is not with religion. The problem is not with technology. The problem is with a misunderstanding, misrepresentation and misapplication either of religion or of technology. That is where we need to work. There is no point throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If one has a cataract, one could solve the problem by plucking out the eye. We will no longer have the cataract, but we also lose the eye, which is so valuable to us. So similarly, with religion, with technology. Yes, undoubtedly we have problems with religion. But if you dispense with religion altogether, you lose also something that is inherently so sublime, so valuable, something that is so essential to our human race. Similarly with technology. We have to see what it takes for humanity to learn to use technology in the proper way. So somebody asked again one time, is technology a blessing or a curse? And the answer I can think of is, technology is a blessing that comes with many curses. <laughs> it's a package deal. You know, it is like those advertisements you see in the television. You buy this particular washing powder and you get one pen free. One person I know who has bought a flat in the holy land of Vrindavan in a, an apartment, a multi-story apartment complex that has come up there and it has openings on all sides to facilitate ventilation and air and light and so on. For those of you who are familiar with that part of the country, you know that it abounds with monkeys. 
So the moment this person came to this house and took and took possession of the flat, uh, he saw that there were monkeys all over. The moment he opened the door, there were monkeys outside, and it was sometimes a little frightening to him. So they had to always be very careful in, in navigating their ways down the stairs to come out. So they complained to the uh, person, the real estate man who had uh, built the building. He said, but you know, there's so many buildings here, uh, so many monkeys here, I beg your pardon. So the man replied, you see, when you buy a flat, you get the monkeys free. <laughs> so technology is like that. When you get technology, yes, you get all the benefits, yes, but you also get all the curses with it. You get all these things that come together. So this is something we also need to keep in mind. Technology, somehow or the other, the way it works, has this kind of an impersonalizing effect, almost a dehumanizing effect. There is a proverb in English that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. One of the meanings of this proverb is that when one has good intentions, if they are put into action, they could possibly lead to many unintended harmful consequences. So when we unleash the enormous power for good that technology has in it, that is inherent in it, we should also carefully consider all the possible harmful consequences that will invariably, inevitably arise from the use of such technology. I think it is important not only for economists and politicians and others, but also for those in the field of technology to consider these things. As one of the panelists pointed out in the discussion before my talk, the technology is here to stay and perhaps the topic itself needs to be reframed because it's here whether we like it or not. And indeed, that is a fact. We have let the genie out of the bottle and now we have a hard time dealing with it. And we have to deal with all the fallouts of it in as much as we have to also harness the good uh, things that it has to offer before us. So how to tap in to the benefits of technology without facing the harmful consequences that it has. And in order to do that, I believe that we need to examine the underlying philosophy of life that drives technological advancement in the first place. What is the impetus? What is it that is responsible for the irrepressible urge for humanity to want to just innovate more and have more technology, more advanced technology, more and more and more? And I would beg to submit here that even though there are many people who are well motivated and who would like to invent and utilize technology for the good, there is also a very large section of humanity that has selfish interests at heart in the development of technology. There is greed, for example. There are other forms of selfish interest. There may be political, military, and other interests involved that make humanity move upwards in a spiral that seems to be endless, an endless competitive spirit well, competition is good to some degree when it is healthy, but when it is driven by negative emotions, when it is driven by materialistic ideologies, then I think one needs to examine, one needs to hold on. Because technology comes with so many other things. It brings a culture. It changes our lifestyle in ways that we perhaps cannot foresee. 
I was hearing a lecture by a professor of physics, an American professor who is of Japanese origin. He was talking about the future of the world and about how technology would shape it. And he was speaking about robotics. And he said that, you know, robotics is, is very popular in Japan. It is one of the countries that has uh, made path-breaking innovations in robotics. And he said that uh, robotics is used uh, and very popular in, in Japan. Do you know for what? He asked his audience. And many of the members of the audience gave different answers. He said no. The real reason why robotics has taken such a <clears throat> uh, prominent position in Japan is because they need robots to take care of the elderly. Because there is hardly any family structure left. The young people are all out. The elderly people are left to fend for themselves. And there's no one to take care of them. The state cannot obviously take care of all the elderly people. In this age of outsourcing, it is a moot point that the individual is outsourcing his or her responsibilities and duties to the state and to others. Taking care of the elderly is our responsibility, not the state's. But when we give up our responsibilities and we are so preoccupied with our own economic development, our own technological and social development, we neglect the most important place in our life, which is our home. And because we neglect that aspect of our life, the social fabric crumbles. And divorces and dysfunctional relationships amongst many other problems are just a few that arise from such an attitude. Why is it that today the elders in Japan need robots to look after them? Is this a sign of things to come for all other countries, including India? So therefore, we need to see that the materialistic, that the materialism that is driving the world today, that is the paradigm of, of uh, shall we say, functioning of people in the world, needs to be re-looked at. And what do we do? How do we rectify this fault? I think it was Einstein who said that a problem can be solved only by coming up with a solution that arises from a level of consciousness that is higher than that which caused the problem in the first place. But if we attempt to generate solutions to our problems which emanate from the same intellectual and behavioral platform, then we will not be able to solve the problem. We, they, we will have many more problems that are generated. So the only solution, therefore, is to come to a higher spiritual platform which means to understand that essentially we are all spiritual beings. It is not only the body and the mind and the intelligence that are important for us. Our own spiritual development should be of paramount importance. Our scriptures say that spiritual, attaining spiritual perfection is actually the perfection of our life. It is a goal of our life and a civilization that is founded on such principles, where such pursuits are given emphasis and where the civilization understands that technology and the world at large, the material world, is also to be harnessed. But it has to be harnessed in a balanced way, keeping in mind that there is a spiritual goal to be achieved. Material, material ambitions are not ends in themselves. They are means to an end. And if we are not clear about the ends, then we will run into the same conundrums in which we are now, and they will only intensify as time passes. Adopting a spiritual paradigm, understanding that we are essentially spiritual beings, and it is only by accepting and learning spiritual knowledge and applying it in life in a practical way that this is the only way we can overcome that materialistic, selfish tendency 
that drives us to misuse technology, it is only then that we can actually learn to harness technology for the good of humanity at large. The ancient scriptures of India give us our vast treasure house of wisdom. There is so much knowledge avail available there. There is so much spiritual technology available there. Technology that is very subtle. Technology that is very refined, very sublime. If only in our eagerness to, to uh, develop the world economically and commercially and politically and technologically, if we were to pay a little more attention to this vast treasure house of wisdom, I believe it will do the entire humanity enormous benefit. Because then we will be able to do all these other things, our politics, our economics, our commerce, our technology, we will be able to do these things with the right wisdom. What the world lacks today is wisdom. It doesn't lack information. It doesn't lack technology. It lacks true spiritual wisdom, which can restore that sense of balance, which can give us that vision, that understanding of where we need to go and why and how. Without this navigational principle of spiritual wisdom coming from the spiritual scriptures, we will be struggling in trying to cope with the ill effects of technology. So to conclude, since it is uh, perhaps uh, not the right time and place to expound more on those spiritual practices and techniques, I will conclude by uh, stating that yes, technology is indeed something that uh, we can use for our good, for the world. It is something that is also a gift of God, really speaking. Because this is also knowledge of the intelligence that of so many uh, people in the world uh, which can be used using the gifts of nature. Humanity is suffering and we do not advocate that we should neglect the material aspect of life. But what we say is it needs the balance. Along with the material aspect we have to pay sufficient attention to the spiritual aspect of our lives. And then there will be healthy balance. And with this healthy balance, we will be able to reap the fruits of technology today and in the future. I thank you all very much for your very kind and patient attention. I would like to offer my heartfelt thanks to GAVS uh, for hosting this program. They have made excellent arrangements. Uh, I must say I would like to congratulate uh, Sumit Ganguly and his entire team at GAVS for all their efforts. They are involved in so many other uh, activities uh, in their desire to, to do welfare work for the rest of society and we were discussing that this evening at his office. I would also like to thank the Artha Forum for having arranged this program and for doing such programs at uh, different places all over the world, in America, in Singapore, in India, and so on. I would like to thank all the panelists who gave us much food for thought. And last but not the least, I want to thank all of you who have assembled here this evening to participate in this program. And I hope and pray that I have not offended any sensibilities by speaking a little frankly and perhaps a little harshly uh, on this topic. But as I said, it was a foregone conclusion. Uh, I was to take the contrarian viewpoint, but I hope I have been able to present it in a balanced way. Thank you very much.